Sean doesn't have his mug with him today, so I'll be Dave and Sean. Oh, I'm Sean. Look at that, huh? Newly shaven Sean. This He's is Barstool. And Bantock. The complete bucket list forever than entertainment. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and uh, again, how do we keep doing it? And Who knows? Friends do that help us out. It's uh, not that we're so great. It's that somebody puts a name out there and they might know somebody who knows somebody or ask us and we get lucky. Uh, but we have another great addition to today with another great maritime person who, um, a world-renowned maritime person. So his, his resume looks pretty long, but you're going to know him very, very well for his playing with him. So please welcome George Hebert. Hopefully I'm saying that right. Ebert. It sounds more French that way. Ebert. Yeah. How are you, George? <laughs> I was hoping I said your name right. I was saying George Ebert. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Right on. I have so, a little bit of French in me, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so we're going to jump in, sir. You're joining us today from where? Bedford. Bedford. Okay. Yeah. So, Becca, so you're in a heat wave like Dave. Dave and I are, which uh, some some people might say it's overdue. I I'm not really enjoying it, but hey, we'll get through it, right? <laughs> so tell us a bit about yourself. A couple of friends of mine gave me uh, gave me a little bit of background on you, but I thought I always like to say it's great to come from the source than uh, me regurgitating information. So um, you've got a resume, um, and a lot of people, a lot of our musician friends will know you, but for, for people that go, hmm, I think I do. Tell us a little bit about George. Well, I started playing in bands in Moncton back in the in the sixties, the, the Beatle eras and all that. And then uh, I I've been very lucky along the way. You know, you get you know, all these great breaks. You know, um, I, uh, when we were at the band in Moncton, we got to do a uh, Frank Spencer and music on my BBC, uh, like kind of regular guests. And um, and then uh, that sort of led me to knowing the producer Manny Pitts and whatnot. And then. Uh, and so, anyway, then after after all that kind of like came to a close, I, I moved to a, moved to Ontario, played with with the band down there for a couple of years, and somehow I hooked up with Manny Pitson over there, who's the producer of uh, uh, Sing Along Jubilee and, and Music Hop, and uh, he uh, he just happened that the guitar player was leaving, Brian Hearn was leaving, and uh, so he asked me if I was interested in the job. So I mean, it was, it was great because I just moved to Halifax and. Uh, just jumped right into doing television. And so did that for many years. I mean, did uh, Sing Along Jubilee for about five, six years. And then uh, actually, actually, I moved back to Ontario after that and then for a couple of years. But then I got another call from, from the TBC producer. He, things were really picking up again. So I moved back to Halifax. And, uh, I've been here ever since. I mean, I did a lot of television for no years. So did Denny show Denny Dorn, Mark Osborne, Sunshine Hour. He did all these different shows and TV long at the time. And so um, yeah, and then and then that led me to uh, not only that, but it led me to playing with Anne Murray. I mean, so I played with Anne Murray and ended up on the road with her for thirty years. Thirty years. Wow. Yeah. So here's a little true story. Now I remember being in Cut Camp, and I was probably what nine years old and we were all in our little bunks and people were talking about the music that they like and there's now sean will appreciate this uh some of the cool kids are like yeah i really like kiss and i really like led zeppelin and i really like deep purple and they're looking what do you like mcpherson is like and i love Anne Murray. i'm sorry but i do i loved Anne Murray's voice since i was a little kid and i still do i mean she's an absolute songstress and i mean yeah. a 30 year career for you that's awesome george really yeah yeah yeah, it's just unusual, really, to to have to be able to get that much, uh, you know, continuity out of it. Uh, it was great. I mean, uh, we we played all over the world, so, and uh, that came to a that came to a close in two thousand and eight, uh, and I've been in Halifax ever since, ever since locally, and you know, mess around in my home studio and things like that. So, so are you? We're talking to a lot of guys. Um... And girls who uh, you know might have done similar things, just you know, session players or, or in in people's bands and whatnot, and then it ends and they kind of you know rejuvenize themselves or they they reinvent themselves with studio work. 
Are you finding in our fair neck of the woods that there's enough of that to keep you going or are you still having to go out and, and play gigs or what are you, what are you finding? Yeah, there's no, there's not enough studio work now. I don't even know if there is any studio work <laughs> going well, on. Cause I mean, they're like all the big studios sort of closed down and then there's uh, the, most of the studios around now are basically home studios, I think in, in town here, with the exception of maybe, uh, 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 Oh, geez, what's the one downtown there? It sounds, uh, I forget the name of it, but it's uh, it's on Hall oh, Street. The one that uh, Sonic Events is part of. Is yeah, that the one? Yeah, yeah. Sonic yeah. Temple, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. probably the only real studio, I think, in town. And, and Scott Ferguson's got a home studio, but it's a really yeah. nice one. It's got isolation booths and everything else. And, and uh, like, uh, I know there's probably oodles of guys that have home studios, but, uh, you know, it's... It, the ones, uh, the ones with the experience, or like Scott Ferguson and myself, and, and you know, a couple of other guys, you know, get more, the more experience of, of recording. So, whether that, I'm, and I'm pretty sure that translates to <laughs> getting better, better projects, you know, uh, in the end, you know, even if the technology is all out there, not everybody has that. Sure. But uh, without the experience of uh, knowing uh, how to record what and what to put with what and basically the arrangements and everything else. It all comes into play. Well, I guess here's my question for you now, George. It's like you were in the heyday, the right place at the right time. And we talked to Bruce Dixon too, and he had a very similar story with the CBC. So it seems that there's a lot of, and without getting too crass, I'm sure you could have a decent income based on playing live music or playing music at the studio for CBC and then the adjoining guests that came on there. Like, is that heyday? Do you think we'll ever see something like that again? I don't know. I mean, there's uh, the only thing going on right now that I can see is uh, it's on the French network and it's uh, with uh, Sam de my country, Ray Legere, those guys were involved in that, Donnie Chapman. And, uh, but I mean, with the COVID, I mean, that sort of stopped for, for a bit, but I'm sure that'll pick up again. And uh, that's uh, out of, uh, it's a company out of Moncton, but they had been doing them here at Aldrich Land, uh, the, the French part of it. So, uh, I mean, they, they would be doing, you, know, you can make good money with COVID, you can actually make actually make a living just out of that wow almost because i mean and, and when we were when we were doing television i mean we were making pretty good money and it was cbc but you're not, you're not gonna make any money with atv or cpv <laughs> i don't know i don't want to get into that but i mean i find they just they just try to get you for nothing <laughs> they think that they think they want to do it for the exposure <laughs> right i was gonna say exposure hey it's good exposure yeah because you know we as musicians are always trying to do free stuff for exposure right exactly yeah, yeah. um and, and that kind of always made me laugh is that you know uh you know I've, I've played in a number of bands that have done weddings and you know they pay for the hall they pay for the, well, they pay for the food they pay for the booze well i've got 200 bucks do you want to be my man no i don't sorry you know what i mean <laughs> i know yeah I remember one time I was asked to do, uh, actually it was with Andy, we were doing this thing and it was supposed to be for, for some good cause and they asked the band if we do it for nothing. And, uh, and, and I said no, you know, and then, and then I went and asked the, uh, the audio guys and all that and if they had been asked and they said no, they hadn't been asked to, to donate their time. I'm thinking, why is it always the musicians? Why didn't he ask the sound guys? <laughs> yeah, yeah, ex exactly. It's interesting because coming out or the of this or the catering or something <laughs> yeah yeah but um you know it's it's funny because music is 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 one of those ones right now that um and it, it kind of drives me a little bananas right we're the ones like i heard the other day that a couple of the bars were told tell the singers not to sing too loud because uh you know it could cause stuff to happen and you know we're we're being asked to kind of take stuff on faith and it's just another version to me of hey just do stuff for free and it'll all work out you know what i mean like it's sort of frustrating. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, so. Let's take back to the Ann Murray years for a second now, George. So like you started with Ann Murray in what, the early 80s? Uh, 1979. Well, I had played with her for one year in 75. Uh, that was the, the old band and it was only for one year. That's when she decided to have children. And things got really weird there for a while. I mean, then, <laughs> in terms of the drug days or something with some people. <laughs> and so she, she just like, just kind of stopped the whole thing, and then, uh, but then, uh, then it sort of picked up again, and that's when I was here in '79. And it went to 2008. So I, I spent like 29 years plus the one plus the year in '75, and uh, 
plus a couple of years on television there too. So. And you were right around the world with them, eh? How was that? You were right around the world with Ann Murray. Yeah, yeah. We, our, I guess, like uh, probably ninety percent of our plane was in the U.S. Uh, we did do uh, Europe. We went to England two, three times. We went to Germany, Holland. We went to Australia three times, and in New Zealand. Wow. So, uh, as a as somebody that I wouldn't consider myself a, uh, you know, I, I I do read a bit, but. Those types of gigs now, would you be, would they be chart type gigs or would, would they be, you know, you played the song so many times you just know them and she calls something and. It was a bit of both. I mean, like we, you had to play like the record and, and usually the record had been done, you know, either in Nashville or LA or something like that. So they give you a chart and they give you the, the music to it and uh, you're expected to learn it. I mean, now I'm not a reader, a note reader. I mean, I'm really, really good at chord charts. I can actually read notes slowly. I mean, not not sight read them, but I mean, if I had to play like an intro that's, that's written out, uh, just give me a couple hours and I'll figure it out and I'll play it. I'm the same way. Every good boy deserves much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you have the recording and the music, I mean, it's pretty easy to put it together. So, so what was your favorite time with Anne? Like, what was your favorite gig? <laughs> Well, there's not any one favorite gig, but I mean, there was like a whole lot of really great, gig, great gigs. I mean, got to hang out with Glenn Campbell quite a few times, and uh, we uh, probably some of the really nice gigs were really nice gigs for the uh, the Greek Theater in L.A. I mean, they put those their outdoor gigs at night, you know, and the, usually the, the the moon hanging there and everything. And uh, we did some uh, we did the, the ones in Australia were really. I mean, traveling to Australia was pretty really amazing, and, uh, and there were some nice gigs. Uh, in, in the U.S., I mean, we, we did like Fort Myers. I mean, we did Florida a lot. We did California a lot. We had a really nice gig once in uh, in uh, 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 it's one of the wineries in Northern California, in uh, at the Wente Brothers Winery. I'm not sure exactly sure with, with the, the name of the city near there, but it's uh, near Sacramento, just just north of San Francisco. And uh, it was a it was one of those winery gigs where I, well that they had like a the whole gig was uh, people paid for dinner and the show and everything, and we had all the tables, white white tablecloths and everything, and uh, we got a tour of the winery and uh, it was beautiful. Yeah. Nice. Um, so you um, you had mentioned how long you you sort of did that that show and and or with Anne, and then you did sort of things back and forth. In terms of today, um, you know what types of calls getting now um you know and, and and what types of things are you you taking on <clears throat> excuse me well i've been mostly playing mostly playing light jazz gigs and uh but as far as calls i mean like well lately it's all been like since the covid like most of the calls i've been getting lately have been for shooting videos doing video shoots and uh i've had about four of those going did one and then there's another and there's another one coming up and there's something else coming up in August. I'm not really sure what that is, but and uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of video shooting because of COVID. But but for the most part, like uh, yeah, I, I just do local jazz gigs. And uh, I mean I get I get a call like where somebody just calls me, Can you do Thursday night? And I'll go, Yeah, sure, you know, and or you might say, uh, <coughs> excuse me. I remember I, I was uh, just before I, before COVID, COVID hit, actually, I had committed to doing all of March, all the Thursday nights in March at uh, downtown and, and the Jazz Cave. But we only did one of them, and then they, they closed her down. So, um, it's the same story we hear. A lot of people had so much stuff booked for the whole year, and it's just, you know, they're talking 2021 now for live music. And, I mean, and we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, but we're, we're trying to get a lot of people's opinions. It's like, you know, and we're not trying to focus on, on the pandemic. We know it's here, obviously. But it's, mm -hmm. you know, and we're, I think we're all building underground and it's going to spout up again. I mean, people need live music, you know, to yeah. heal, to feel something, yeah. to, you know, to be oh, yeah. promoted yeah. to, you know, and it's important for, for yeah. the arts industry. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that to me is, you know, one of the, one of the frustrating things that a lot of musicians are, I guess, kind of, you know, telling us is the fact that, you know, it is so important to people yet it's almost being, treated as the the ugly ch stepchild you know what i mean like the <laughs> you know <laughs> the minute is the child yeah and it's like you know it everybody you know they just think it's going to keep bouncing back and keep bouncing back and eventually 
guys like you, George, are just going to go, you know what? I had enough. Like, uh, I'll, I'll do my things, but uh, the heck with you guys. I'm, and I refer to that more the, you know, I guess the, maybe the bar level, but even live, live venues, I mean, it just, it just doesn't seem like there's a plan at no. all to get this no. going. Very frustrating. No. no, that's for sure. Yeah. No, I mean, fortunately, like my, I mean, I'm sort of uh, in my career, I, I don't have to play for a living. And so, I mean, to me, it's just like uh, I'm playing for, for the joy of it now. So, and uh, so I, I take whatever comes along and, you know, if nothing comes along, it's, it's fine. But I mean, I, I feel sorry for the people who, who depend on, uh, you know, depend on it for a living. They, they must, some of them must have had a bit of a hard time there, you know, because uh, some of them are full-time musicians that make it pretty good money and then it just went, yeah, nothing. Yeah. True. <laughs> Now, during your MRE years, or even beyond, I said, it's, did you do a lot of writing? Uh, I did. I did. I wrote a few instrumentals, but back in the '90s, for some reason, I went through a writing spree, and then, but nothing, nothing. <laughs> I don't know what I mean. I was into the George Benson thing, and things were really happening. We were playing at, at a jazz bar in Halifax, and, and we were everything was going on. And I mean, I, I was like just coming up with stuff, but. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't consider myself much of a writer, but I mean, uh, I, I could probably sit down and write write an instrumental if I had to. You know, somebody should <laughs> punch me and force me to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, question that I have for you, George, and, and this is uh, purely um, for, I guess, intel for, for musicians that want to go down the path that you've gone down, you know, the, the session guy, the guy that comes in that maybe does a track on something or plays. Um, it, it, a, would you consider it a good living even now? And B, is there a residual aspect to it? You know, do you still get paid from some of that stuff? I would never ask you how much, but is there something that you would still see that? No, there's, there's been very little of uh, of uh, doing sessions with with money coming back at you after after the fact. Then you always used to try to do a buyout or something. That, I mean, I've done lots of things where they say, uh, I mean, they pay you a little more, and then it's a buyout. In other words, like, don't come. <laughs> if we run it again, it's too bad, you know. Like, you, you've yeah, been, yeah. and I mean, there's been some things we've made really good money because we were planning on running it a lot. But uh, no, I, I mean, as far as residuals or royalties or anything, no. I mean, I, I've gotten very, very little of that. I, I, I probably get more royalties when I, uh, I did my first album that I for CDF, but I uh, it was all uh, original instrumental. That's when I was in the writing boat there. And, uh, and they were, there was a radio station in, in Bedford here that was, they had mandated that they were going to play an instrumental every three tunes or something like that. So, um, and it was going to be Canadian and this and that. So they, they were playing my stuff all the time and CBC played it. And, and, and I was getting, uh, from SOCAN, I was getting residuals every, every quarter. And, uh, and it, it was like about $250 per quarter, but that's a thousand dollars a year, you know, and, and I had done it myself, so I mean, it was really, it was it was kind of a good thing, you know. I mean, and that that went on for about five years. Okay. So you, you know, getting these soaking checks uh, every quarter. So see, go ahead. It's only because of that I, I I had written and I owned the pub. I mean, I owned the publishing. I owned everything. You know, and I was I was getting a hundred percent of the whatever. I was just gonna ask. So, so CBC would have had to follow the mandates of like scale for for actors and musicians and, and for and for live performances. And that's probably where the money was, I guess, when you think back. It's like, if you're going to appear on TV, you're going to appear on the radio, you know, they're the Canadian broadcasting, they're, they're a Canadian brand corporation. They have to pay what they're supposed to pay. And I guess that's right. up, it, it kind of changed a bit. Eh? Yeah, that's right. Because back then, that's why we were making good money, because they were doing, they were going right by, right by the book, by the rule and everything. And they even had a guy who was in the studio to make sure that if you did, like a, a solo in a piece, they, they would write that down, and that was called a featured musician, right? And I mean, you get paid for it. It was it was all ooh, above board. It was great. Yeah. In, in the day, it was all above board. <laughs> yeah. I hate that term. In the day, I'm really starting to hate that because it's it's like it's like back in the day, in the day, in the day, in the day. You know. I'll tell you what, though. I uh, I don't consider myself a big news junkie, but you read some of the stuff that's going on in this day right now. It's like it, it blows me away how oh, I know. Uh, again, music is just getting toasted, and people that are working really hard aren't getting paid yeah. for it. But yeah. um, on all, all all day about that. Um, and the reason why I, I asked that because we had Bruce Wheaton on the show, and Bruce was talking about 
a number of years ago, uh, Cass Elliott recording one of his tunes, and he didn't find out till about three or four years after the fact. And I'm sitting there going, I don't know that that would happen necessarily now, but <laughs> yeah. um, you know, that that's something where again, yeah. It, it, it's like, oh, do it for the exposure. Well, the hell with exposure. I want the money. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, a, it's a, becoming a bad word for the exposure. <laughs> All right. Well, it's, it's funny because I mean, if you think of like if Apple will come up with some new bullshit thing, you know, look at this new blah 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 from Apple, and they'll spend all the money to to publicize it and put it out there, and it's a product that we as a consumer buy. It's no different than a musician or a singer or an audio tech or like they're putting a product out there that a consumer wants to buy, but there's I don't know what happened. It's like the the venues are gone and the people don't seem to care. They can get it all for free, so why would they pay for it? You know, yeah. what's, what's your thoughts? Like, what can we do? Well, I don't know. That's what I was going to say. I mean, like, uh, it seems like now people just want to download everything for free and all that. I mean, I, I, I download, but I mean, I go to iTunes. If I want an album, I go to yeah. iTunes and I pay my nine ninety nine, and I got an album, you know, and I think that's great. I mean, it's still kind of cheap, really, because if you went to, there was a CD store, you'd pay 20 bucks for it. It was nine ninety nine for the download. And, uh, but uh, that's the way, I mean, I, I would not think of, trying to download something for free but i mean it seems like most people nowadays if they they got to find some download free download somewhere and even on even uh, even some of these uh, download uh, places like whether it be itunes or spotify or this and that i mean the, the money that the artist makes in the end, like, apparently it's just next to nothing i mean no i mean, the, i've seen the numbers 0. 0.0002 cents per stream or per hit or whatever the hell it is that jesus yeah. christ yeah well, again, and I was talking with somebody this morning, and it was really kind of along the same line. We don't want to beat up on this point too much, but uh, this person who's a musician was talking to one of their local politicians. And basically, he was talking about how there was no help for his industry. And the politician said, well, you're not an essential service. And his line was, well, I pay my mortgage with this, and I feed my family with this. So to me, I am an essential service. And he said, the politician just was like... <gasps> And that was the end of the conversation. And I think, in my mind, that's where we have to get these people. Because everything's going to them downtown, right? When it's already going good, like J.P. Cormier, that was, you know, with the internet thing. Yeah. Um, you know, he was on the radio last week, and a bunch of a bunch of people were, oh, you know, he's just some guy doing some artsy fartsy stuff. Well, no, he's <laughs> he's trying to do some for his community. Um, and so I guess my point is, is these people that are working hard, they, man, they really got to, we, we've regressed, I think a lot and we need to, we need to get back to seeing these people get paid. Right. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, JP is a major Atlantic Canadian artist. I mean, really, really major. He's, he's, he's done so much for the, for the music industry and, and with his talent. He's, he's just, it's unbelievable. Well, he had a really neat thing where he was talking again about the exposure. He had this thing. It was a post about two weeks ago that I shared. And basically he said, God love the, the, the venue. They were trying to put on a, a show. He said, but what mm -hmm. they did is they're selling tables for 40 bucks. Mm -hmm. So he said, you know, my ticket that I have, that's about 35 or $40 per show that I do now, you know, about 10 people now it's about $6 and 50 cents per person. <laughs> Meanwhile, this venue is still getting their food. They're still getting their booze. They're still getting all their money, and they want the musician to do the exposure. That thing is was the point. So you know, this is a thing. Like again, we could beat it to death all day, but it's just for me, it's one of these things. Talking with so many people that we gotta we gotta get this out in the forefront and get people, you know, yeah. understanding that this is this is an essential service in my opinion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Exactly. I don't think I'm running for office here today, guys. I don't know what's up with me today. But anyway, I know. But we're all kind of cranky today. It's funny. <laughs> I don't know what you did, George. You're probably the worst of Sean and I. I'm getting more and more mad the more I talk about it. At the end of the day, we can't, we can't change the world in a day. But you know what? We're going to keep yeah. plugging forward, and we're going to try and change people's opinions. You know, and maybe one person at a time to see yeah. the value of what an artist or what an entertainer does will help change the world maybe who knows right but i mean we all we can't live in the yeah. past you know we the, there was good money back then and yeah. in your day there's great exposure there's tv there was lots of things that were going on but there's got to be a new way for yeah. folks to get paid for the things that they do because it's a heartfelt product that they're creating yeah. yeah i still think that you know variety tv shows 
I mean, they, they should make a comeback. I, mean, I, I really oh miss God. them. I mean, like, uh, oh, yeah. that's why, I mean, I watched this uh, French TV show a month and they were rain those guys. Jeez, it's like, like, I didn't miss that because it's like, ah, live musician playing real music and, and guest stars and everything. And you see different people from different regions. It's like, they got to get back to that because, I mean, and, and I mean, I, now that they, hopefully that now that they say, yeah, some people say that the CD is dead. I mean, uh, hopefully they'll have some other means of, uh, you know, selling music that, that makes a reasonable amount of money. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it obviously be, might be download, but I, at least it would be a, a way of, uh, of you know, from sales. Absolutely. And, you know, it's funny because you talk about the variety of TV shows. We as Canadians, there's some Canadianism that, things that we haven't I remember playing a show last year and there was maybe I don't know 10 people in this audience and our guitar player does a solo and everybody starts clapping and somebody says it's just like the Tommy Hunter show and we all got it right away because you remember that <laughs> Take a solo, you know what I mean and yeah. that's part of uh, that's part of that that Canadian TV experience that um, you know we we used to get up here with all these things yeah yeah uh, that, that, that that whole concept when music stop has started and, and you know it's from a different city every day and it from like from, from Monday to Friday it was Vancouver Edmonton uh, Winnipeg Toronto Montreal and Halifax there was nothing better to the United country than that you could be able to see what a band does in Vancouver and the next day what a band does in Edmonton <laughs> yeah you know that's a good point you, you unite a country together that way right you do yeah for sure. George, I'm wrong well, on time, brother. I just had a couple, a couple of clothing that I'm sure Deshaun does too. Uh, I guess, what's your, what, uh, what do you listen to now? Like, what's, like, what's on your turntable, whatever, <laughs> lack of a better word, now? It was like freezing there a bit. Yeah, yeah. I, I think what Dave's trying. To what, what, what's, what's the music business to you now? Like, what, what are things that you're looking at doing, and you know, what's important to you now? Well, like I said before, I mean, at, at this stage of my career, I mean, like, I'm 76 years old. I mean, I, I'm just, uh, I'm just taking what comes along, and hopefully things come along. I mean, if, if nothing comes along, it's still okay with me because I'm set. My career is basically <laughs> behind me. <laughs> well, I, I, I have to say, and I'm wearing these sunglasses to cover my bloodshot eyes, but if I look at half as good as you at 76, I'll be happy with that because. Uh, <laughs> You know, I would have never pegged you for for that. Not that that's old. That's still young. But um, it's that's the Francais. That, uh, see, that's the Francais. <laughs> yeah. All, all of a sudden, Colombo shows up out of nowhere. There he is. Um, but um, I don't know if you heard his answer, Dave. But I mean, I, I sort of just I, I thought that you were asking him what you know what he was still looking to do and looking to accomplish, and he gave a great answer. Yeah. Actually, I was asking what, what you're listening to these days. Is kind of what I was asking, but that's okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, listening to well, I try. I I, I listen to a lot of YouTube, and uh, and I you know, of course, you discover so many things. Uh, there's there's the, there's a group in Australia that does cover tunes, and they're unbelievable. You know, like it, they almost seem like studio musicians or something like that. They do such an incredible job on all these cover tunes. And then there's also a group of young kids in uh, in Barcelona that's playing jazz, big band jazz. You know, like and they're only in like from ages of uh, 10 to 17 or something. Wow. They're unbelievable. <laughs> and so they, it's the, this is pretty low that I'm listening to these days. Uh, and, uh, my, uh, my favorite thing about YouTube is going on and seeing a two-year-old playing Neil Peart songs. That's, uh, that's, I love that. You <laughs> really how the learning curve has gone way up with, with technology these days, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> right on. Well, George, listen, well, I want to go ahead. No, I was just going to say, we want to thank you for, for, for being part of this, George. I mean, you're really, uh, you're a guy that, um, you know, obviously we've heard about you. It's great to finally meet you. Uh, you bring a lot of history, a lot of pedigree to, to our, our region. And, you know, it's good to hear uh, a guy from Atlanta, Canada, but good old Moncton that had such great experiences to share with people, because I do think that it gives, um, you know, I, I read something, I don't know, a while back where they said, you know, basically where you live will impact your success. And I think that, you kind of upset that and up, upset that theory and kind of knocked it on us here. So good on you, sir. Well, thank you. It's going to be a pleasure being here with you guys. George, we thank you so much for being on the show, brother. And like, uh, just, uh, 
yeah, just thanks for, for, for educating us a little bit more about, you know, the, the way things were and, and just how it influenced you and how you influence others. It's kind of maritimers beget each other, you know, this person beget, 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 beget. And at the end of the day, it's like, you know, we're a proud community of, of hardworking, good work ethic musicians and entertainers. And it's to, yeah. due to a lot of folks like you who paved that way. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks. And, and the last thing I'll say is, the opinions that were expressed were Sean's, not George's. So <laughs> have to put you on. <laughs> yeah, great... we'll piss somebody off today. But who, who gives a shit? That's what yeah. we do. <laughs> George, thanks again, brother. We appreciate you coming on. Okay. Thank you. Take care.